Welcome everybody, welcome back uh, to another installment of the Dharma Doors. I'm your host, MC Owens. It is so great to see everybody popping in. Oh, so wonderful to see everybody. I hope everybody's healthy. I hope everybody is safe. I hope everybody is loved. Um, if you're not feeling loved, I love you. And I mean that big maha, big maha metta, big maha karuna, big maha mudita, and big upeksha coming your way. Uh, uh, so everybody, this is going to be uh, uh, part two of our Ashoka Data Sutra from the Ratnakuta, the heap of jewels, sutra number 32. Um, I mentioned last week, I sort of, you know, segued us out of the Vimalakirti Sutra. And in many ways, the Vimalakirti Sutra, although uh, Michael Taft and I planned that series long ago, it was sort of the just <laughs> the perfect sutra for a pandemic. You know, it was really this <laughs> discourse about illness and all that was really, really uh, fortuitous uh, uh, that that, that that you know, was the right, that was the right sutra, obviously. Um, and so segueing out of the pandemic into our new world here, I did last week decide from a variety of sutras, all connected to Vimalakirti, I decided to go with this Ashoka Datta. Um, originally, originally last week, Fearless Virtue, and that is indeed the title in the English translation that I'm reading from, right? This is the prophecy of Bodhisattva Fearless Virtue, Ashoka Datta, uh, her, her attainment of Buddhahood. Um, I'm switching the name up a little bit because uh, I have a little bit to relate to you about that. So, the re of course, the reason why I chose that sutra last week is because I felt we could all um, use that dose of, of fearlessness, right? That that was sort of something that we could use. And in particular, well, the way I introduced it last week in terms of uh, the, the Chinese, and I think everybody knows that I work with the Chinese and I sort of pretend to work with the Sanskrit, uh, but this uh, way, duh, right? Fearless virtue. Indeed, that is what the Chinese means is fear, fearless virtue. And last week, what I was going with was this the virtue of fearlessness, like that idea and sort of that, um, that mode or that mood. And that, that stays true. That stays true. So I'm not, nothing is being reneged or redacted here. We're adding, we're just adding, which is that I've done since we last met, I've done a little bit of digging into our data. This, uh, so Ashoka, fearless, a uh, very powerful idea in Buddhism, of course. The Buddha or Buddhism, the Dharma, is uh, the bestower of fearlessness. That's like the idea of the practice is one of the one of the qualities that is developed is fearlessness, right? Um, and that abaya, usually it's abaya, but ashoka we can hang with ashoka. So fearless, data. So uh, now that I've learned a little bit more Sanskrit since last week. Um, the idea is, is like, so it comes actually, the, the key, the key was this famous uh, figure in Buddhism called Devadatta. And once I looked into Devadatta, whose name means God-given. So devas are the gods. And so Devadatta is God-given. And I did mention this last week that there's a deep, deep connection between dana and datta. Data as giving, but dana as like gift giving in a way. Well, so what we're really talking about in the Sanskrit with Ashoka Data is fearless given. Uh, you know, just add that to this layer of meaning of this uh, of this idea of this virtue or this quality that comes from fearlessness, right? So we're gonna be going deeper into this young 12 year old bodhisattva's fearlessness tonight and the wisdom that she has to share with us um i think I've, i was thinking about a few different ways to start this off 
Um, I, of course, do want to bring us back up to speed about the story of this sutra. Um, it's sort of a funny, it's a funny little sutra, a very funny little sutra about um, sort of a typical day in the life of the Buddha hanging out, Mount Rajgriha, and these 10 uh, shravakas, these 10 monks, these 10 male senior monks, all go to Ajatashatru's house, King Ajatashatru, the king of Magadha. Did I mention we're in Magadha? So the king of Magadha's house. <laughs> and these 10 monks show up, and the king stands up, the queen stands up, all the servants stand, everybody stands up to bow and greet these 10 monks. Except for Ajatashatru's young daughter, Ashoka Datta, refuses to stand up. And I mentioned this, I, I went into detail last week about sort of clarifying what's at stake here in, in this exchange, where there's a lot of things being challenged by this young woman, right? By this, 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 by her, by Ashoka Datta, right? There is this challenging of her father who's telling her, hey, stand up, and she won't. So challenging patriarchy, right? These monks are all senior than her, so her elders, not standing up to the elders either. So there goes seniority. And ultimately, what she's going to be not standing up to is sanctimony, which is this idea that these guys are holier than she is ultimately that's sort of the idea now if you were here for the vimalakirti sutra or here for other sutras that i teach this this um the sign of discourse or this back and forth about bodhisattvas and shravakas bodhisattvas bodhisattvas, right? In beings of enlightenment, beings bound for enlightenment, right? Ashoka Datta is our bodhisattva in this story, right? And so she's going to exude what it means to be a bodhisattva. These shravakas, what I basically talked about last week was how, or what I talk about all the time, is how these monks, they represent an, an old way of doing Buddhism, the old program. Um, you know, Buddhism is a very, very old tradition, a very old meditation tradition. And, well, again, you know, just to summarize Ashoka Datta's point, and I'm going to read a little bit to get us back up to speed. But her point, just to clarify, is that the path, the vehicle, that they, these 10 monks ride, the vehicle that they ride, the path that they walk, the type of Buddhism that they practice, this Hinayana type uh, Buddhism, Shravakayana is what it would be called in that sense. The critique is, is that it is a path for enlightenment for you and, and you alone. <laughs> It's a great technique, and indeed it is a great technique. It is a path to liberation, and indeed it is a path to liberation. And the Buddha taught and said, are you suffering? Come on, right? I'll teach you the path to not suffering and, and ultimately to liberation. And that happened, and that is the Dharma, the path to liberation, path to end suffering. What seems to have happened sort of historically is that Buddhism grew out of that idea of just seeking enlightenment for oneself and sort of came and flowered, grew into a broader understanding of the idea of, oh, no, 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 no. This actually only works if we all get enlightened. <laughs> That's actually the only way it works. The other way, we all just keep going around and around and around and around. Actually, even you, buddy, even you, buddy, yeah, that you, you made it. No, no, no. It, it, we all just keep going around and around and around. So just to let you know, that's the critique. I think the, the critique, in a way, is alive and well in the world of religion today. 
whether it be the world of Buddhism, the world of Christianity, the world of Islam, the world of you name it, that this idea of like anybody that's just in it for themselves, their own improvement, their own enlightenment, their own salvation, that's the that's the that's the little little vehicle people that's the little vehicle if you're in it just for yourself there is this great vehicle that we're talking about here so that's the the primer the, just to get us kind of uh brought up to speed um ultimately what happens is well ashoka data refusing to get up from her her kind of her couch right did i mention she's got these great jeweled shoes she's got these great jeweled shoes right so we're going to hear a little bit about those later but so when her father is like why what is going on with you are you mad why won't you stand up well Ashoka Datta proceeds to basically lay into her father. And then just when you thought she hadn't laid into her father enough, she recites it all again in verse. <laughs> she like busts out the song in case you didn't get the message Ajata Shatru. Yeah. And so I, for the sake of time last week, I sort of breezed through, just read a few parts of her poetic version. And so tonight, I'm actually going to start in a section uh, from her uh, poem. And there is a, this terminology in Buddhism that traditionally res was reserved for the Buddha. And it was a reserve for the Buddha uh, when he was giving a discourse or making a, a declaration of the Dharma. And what they talk about in Buddhism is making the lions roar. It is this, this, this really poetic idea of sovereignty, fearlessness, pride, certainly. But a good pride, of course. And the idea is that it's this, this bold declaration of the Dharma, the lions roar. Well... What we read about in, in, in a moment is that this is Ashoka Datta's lion's roar, that she gives the lion's roar. And that's sort of like, whoa, it's like not only is it not the Buddha giving the lion's roar, but it's a 12-year-old girl giving the lion's roar, right? And so I just wanted to recap that lion's roar and what the essence of that was. And so um, from this treasury of Mahayana Sutras here, page 120, if you're in it, she's again, re she's reciting her various reasons for not standing up to patriarchy, seniority, and sanctimony, right? She's, she's explaining that. And she says, your majesty, father, have you ever seen a man fighting a battle on a mule? One can win a battle only on a horse or an elephant. A Shravaka is like a mule, while a Bodhisattva is like a dragon elephant. He defeats demons under the Bodhi tree and delivers countless beings from samsara. In the nocturnal sky, all the stars fall into shadow when the full moon rises to illuminate every corner of the world. A Shravaka is like a star, while a Bodhisattva is like the moon, like the full moon. Out of compassion for all sentient beings, Bodhisattvas show the way to Nirvana. The light of a firefly can't help a person work, but when the sun illuminates the earth, all activities can proceed. A Shravaka, like the glow of a firefly cannot benefit many. But a Buddha, endowed with the light of liberation, has compassion for all beings. A jackal cannot by its howl frighten the king of beasts, a lion. But when the lion roars, flying birds fall to the ground. Your majesty, Shravakas fail to bring forth bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. They eliminate afflictions, 
but not to benefit sentient beings. Seeing this, I do not vow to become a Shravaka. And since I've already engendered and made such great resolve, why should I make such a tiny vow? <laughs> Therefore, I do not stand to these Shravakas. Okay, so that's a quick just recap of her message here. This idea that these Shravakas are like fireflies. They only have enough light to illuminate their own activities, <laughs> right? This, uh, this idea, of course, going into battle. And I, I did want to uh, pause for a moment on that analogy, right? Have you ever seen a man going into battle on a mule? One can win a battle only on an elephant, right? Shravakas are like mules, but bodhisattvas are like great dragon elephants it's a the dragon elephant is is a euphemism for a very very large elephant <laughs> like very large right and i wanted to revisit the elephant uh, uh part of the poem here because you guessed it it's tonight's cipher it's the it's the key it's the key to the mysteries tonight which is sort of understanding and appreciating this and, and the elephant, the elephant metaphor. Um, we're going to be coming back to elephants in a moment, but I just wanted to plant that seed of this idea of going into battle on a great elephant, right? This idea that a king rides a great elephant in this, well, this just, just get into it. Just get into sitting on an elephant for a minute, right? And that idea. Okay. So, that's the beginning of it. She makes this grand declaration. I'm not standing up. Here's why I'm not standing up. And, and just, just to clarify one more time, in case you didn't get it, what she's saying is, is that to all these Shravakas that are so enlightened, that are all on their path, off to, on their own enlightenment, right? No matter how enlightened they are, the smallest desire for the benefit of other beings the smallest movement of and gesture of giving towards all other beings you're instantly greater than all of those monks as enlightened as they are <laughs> that's the bodhisattva path she says it she says it that even the the youngest uh, novice bodhisattva is greater than than these because they've made a much greater vow right these monks have made a vow to save themselves. Right. Okay, so I just wanted to drive that one home. Any questions about the recap, where we're at? That was actually recap A, part A. We're, we're going into recap part B. <laughs> okay, so in classic sutra fashion here, Ashoka Dutta gives the lion's roar. And we begin this process of questioning Ashoka Datta, right? And this is sort of a, a formula that happens in all of these sutras, right? And in fact, what it says here, uh, now I'm on page 122, um, then the venerable Shariputra, always Shariputra, right? <laughs> says, Ash Ashoka Datta is so eloquent that she can deliver this boundless discourse. Let me step forward to ask her a few questions and I will find out whether she has realized the truth, <laughs> right? So that's, that's Shariputra's and, and we read this last week, but I digressed into this sort of whole Dharma talk discourse about this idea of signlessness. And I'm glad I did that because I don't really have to do it fully again in that way. Um, but the nature of this discourse well, first of all, their back and forth is about this, where um, um, Shariputra asks Ashoka Datta, so what, what type of Buddhism do you practice in there? <laughs> what, what, what? And I say it funny like that because the language can be a little weird for, pe for people. What she asks is, do you ride the Shravaka vehicle? Right? So if you're into this language of yanas, mahayana, hinayana, shravakayana, like a vehicle, they're talking about a vehicle. 
And they're talking about kind of driving that vehicle to enlightenment, right? <laughs> That's the idea. And so he's asking her, do you ride, do you abide in the Shravaka vehicle like us? You're so smart. You're talking so eloquently. Do you abide in the Shravaka vehicle like us? I modernize that language for you. He's asking, so what kind of Buddhism? What, what, what kind of Buddhism are you practicing here, right? You practice in old school Theravada type of stuff, right? And she says, no. And then he says, oh, do you abide in the Pratekya Buddha vehicle, solitary sage vehicle, the mountain dweller. You've been to the mountaintop dwelling alone and you've become a sage. That's it, right? No. Oh, you, you ride the Mahayana. You ride the great vehicle then. No. <laughs> Shariputra asks further, then in what vehicle do you abide that you are able to make such a lion's roar? And Ashoka Dutta answered, if I, if I were abiding in anything right now, it would be impossible for me to make the lion's roar. But since I abide in nothing, I can make a lion's roar. Hmm. Then they have an, a little back and forth quickly, this idea about si the signless. And I think for, for me, it's tricky, but for me, in order to make this as fun as it can be, in order for me to make this as enlightening as it can be, I, I need to, like, because last week I read this part, but I just sort of read it and then just went off on signlessness. And so tonight, before we get further ahead in the text, I want to just clarify the signless in regards to Ashoka Datta's answer. Okay, so this is going to be a quick reminder of what they're talking about. <laughs> it's a quick reminder of this idea of the signless. And so I brought a prop. This is indeed a magic trick. So this is going to be a Buddhist magic trick. So I've got something in my hand, right? So we're going to start... <laughs> So this, of course, should be, even before I do that, right, this should, you probably knew what this was, right? And so I'm going to walk you through a, a little game, a little uh, mental exercise about this object, right? So the first thing we're, I want to talk about is color. And this is the, the easiest, simplest place to start in understanding this idea of signs. So if we're going to get to this exalted state of signlessness, of no, no signs, we're going to have to have a sense of what they mean by a sign. They're not talking about omens, right? They're not talking about auspicious signs. Signs in Buddhism, sometimes also characteristics, qualities, marks. If you've ever heard those words in a Buddhist uh, milieu, right? Marks, signs, characteristics, qualities. They're talking about the Sanskrit term is a lakshana. And qualities or characteristics are how we know what things are. We, it's how we know what to call them. It's how we know how to ask for them at the grocery store, right? And so, how, what something is, how it is perceived and understood is through its qualities or its characteristics, these lakshana. And I'm going to start with color because color is the easiest lakshana to, to kind of think about and, and get into. If you're like me and you have eyes like mine, you're seeing a, a lime green, the lime green. And so that color, the lime greenness, it is very, very easy, oh, so easy, to think that that green, the greenness that you're seeing, that, that particular kind of neon lime greeny, 
it's very easy to think that that is a quality or a characteristic that is held or possessed by this object. That it's, it, it has it, it is green. And you're just seeing it. It's green and you're seeing the green thing, right? But we know though, here is the thing. We know though that if I had color blindness, for example, it would, it would not be green. It, it would be a different color. Or if I went in surgically and started messing around with the rods and cones in my eye, I could change the color of this, or at least the perceived color of it, right? And that is exactly what I'm getting at with this example of color. Color is a beautiful way to think about pratitya samudpata, codependent arising, codependent origination, Interdependence is another way. Tonight, I think I'm going to use interdependence. You might think that the green is possessed and held as, a, as like a quality by this. But if you understand the way color is working, it is actually the unique characteristics of your eyes with the particular set of rods and cones that you have that are responding to some body of form but that the actual greenness is arising in the in-between. It's an, an, an emergent property that arises when your eyes see this. Because again, somebody with some other kinds of eyes, the color that they're seeing would be emerging, codependently emerging for them in a very different way. I hope you all can just sort of see that idea that, oh, wow, color while it deceptively appears to be held by the object I'm looking at, is actually an emergent property that somehow resides in between my eye and the object. It like kind of arises when the eye and the object come into contact, right? That's the idea that the, gr the greenness, and, oh, and in like fashion, the greenness of course isn't in my eye. It's not here and it's not here, but it emerges in between. If you, if you get that, if you're, if you're touching that and you're like, oh, I see it's an emergent quality that's neither held by the object nor held by me, but is emerging when they're coming into contact, right? If you get that about the greenness, I want to ask you a question. Is this round? Everybody, if for anybody that was like, no, it's not round, right? Right? Oh, wait. Wait, is this, is it round? Oh, snap. Don't tell me that shape is like color. Don't tell me that shape is like color and that the shape of this thing is a dependently arisen emergent quality or property that is arising in between that I'm mistaking for being a quality held by the object the very shape of it, right? Right? Oh, it's round, right? Let me, let me get something really round, right? Let me get a ball. Let me get a ball and ask you which one is the round one. And then I'm going to take it right back from you. Right when you thought I made this round, I'm going to take that right away from you. It's not round anymore, curved maybe. Hardly round though, right? So color and out. It's an emergent, dependently arising. Shape, nah. How many? How many? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm got, I got even a couple of different colors here. And we know, we know about colors, but I got a couple of different colors. I got this thing, I got this thing. I don't know if you've ever used one of these things though, but you don't actually need this. <laughs> right? You can hold it down with something else. You don't actually need this, right? You can hold this down and just light it, right? You don't need, oh, so wait, how many things am I holding? Wait a minute, are you, are you telling me that number, the number is also a dependently arisen emergent thing, that this is neither has color, shape, nor number? Whoa. That is indeed what they're talking about in terms of the signless. 
which is that this, okay, so now let's back up. Remember those qualities or characteristics or marks? <laughs> like, I don't know, color, size, shape. <laughs> Remember those? We used to think that they were how I understood what things were and, and that they were held and that they were held and possessed by objects. And so if I asked you, go get me the lime green lighter, right? Boom, you, you go get it. I got it. Go get the book. Go get that. But what I just showed you was how, <laughs> well, this was, of course, a tricky emptiness Dharma talk. But what I just showed you was that there's no signs. This, this, that thing, your, your mind should already be boggled. What thing? What individual thing? We already, we already dismissed that, right? So if there's no individual thing with no colors, and no shape or size, if, if, you're, if you're kind of like, you're kind of toggling then between the signless and the world of signs. <laughs> the world of signs, characteristics, and marks, this whole world of, of how I know what things are, and then this very, very subtle-ness of si the signless, it's, it's like, it kind of makes your head swim a little bit because all of a sudden the marks and qualities and characteristics of the things that you thought that had them, don't, they don't have them anymore. It's all dependently arising, right? And so Ashoka Datta says, I can make this lion's war because I abide in the signless. I abide in that which has no signs, no marks, no characteristics. It cannot be known. It cannot be seen, heard, smelled, tasted, touched, or even conceived of. She's like that, that, I'm, I'm in that. And Michael has a question, Connie here. Hi, Connie, rock it. Hi, Hi Michael. Um, does then the, the line slash comment, uh, ref, the, um, the perceived is the perceiver. Does that tie into that what you're talking about? Because the perceived is dependent on the perceiver, right? Is this, does that tie into it a little bit? Absolutely, Connie. And as usual, you're three steps ahead. And that's awesome. <laughs> and, I, and I mean that. <laughs> And what I mean by that is, is that I, I've just been getting everybody ready by kind of stripping all the characteristics away. And yeah. you took it to that, that ergo, therefore, level, which is, oh, ergo, therefore, the perceived and the perceiver, lo mismo. Yeah, the same. That's so awesome, Connie. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, just to let you know this, this, so now that you sort of are, are wrestling with, or maybe you're just chilling comfortably in the sign list, right? Hopefully now the, the little d discourse that we'll be going back and forth here, right? Um, Ashoka Datta actually says to Shariputra an interesting question about the sign list. And she says that if the Dharma, if the real teaching of the Buddha that we're talking about, if the Dharma is signless, how can it be sought? <laughs> if everything I just said about this signless thing is true, that it can't be seen, you, like so it'll pa it could pass you on the street, right? <laughs> you can't see it, you can't hear it, you can't smell it, taste it, touch it, even think about it. How, how, could, the, how could the signless be sought right and they go back and forth and have this very very tricky little discourse where well so it's tricky it's so tricky because this is a, such a philosophical discourse because they're they're both trying not to trap themselves into saying anything right there it's being very very careful and so it actually becomes these series of rhetorical questions, right? So how can this signless be sought? 
right? Well, Shariputra, who know, he knows about the signless. He knows about the signless. So he's, he says, Ashoka Dutta. This is his answer. Ashoka Dutta. What is the difference in excellence between the truth, the Dharma of Buddhas, and the truth of ordinary people? And it actually, it took me many, 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 many readings to really get what was being done there, right? But basically, it's sort of like, so how can you seek the signless? Well, what makes Buddha Dharma so much cooler than other dharmas? And it, the, the idea of that retort was that if you, if you are sitting there going like, well, Buddha Dharma is awesome because of emptiness, dependent origination, my, you know, all of these things, then it's sort of like, there's your answer. At least that's what Shariputra wanted. That's what Shariputra wanted to do. He wanted to be like, well, what's the difference between the Buddha's truth and normal two people's truth, right? But she flips it on him and says, what's the difference between emptiness and nirvana? So the emptiness that I just talked about, which is the emptiness of the lighter, there's no lighter there, con construct of <laughs> illusional characteristics, right? Construct of illusional characteristics, therefore emptiness. And she says, what's the difference between that, what I just described, and nirvana? The total quiescence, the total cessation of all suffering, the grand, exalted goal of Buddhism. What is the difference between emptiness and quiescence, Ashoka Datta asks. Shariputra says, there's no difference. There's no difference. Ashoka Datta replies, Shariputra, just as there's no difference in excellence between emptiness and nirvana, so there is no difference in excellence between the truth, the Dharma of the Buddha, and the truth of ordinary people. She says a little bit more there, but I just want to pause. There is a very famous Zen saying that uh, I'm not saying it arises from here at all, but it is a Zen saying that's very, very helpful for understanding what Ashoka Datta just said. The Zen saying is that there is no difference between an enlightened person and an unenlightened person. An enlightened person understands that. And what's happening there, of course, is, and this is sort of a very long-winded way of getting to the, the point of tonight. So that's Zen saying, there's no difference between the an enlightened person and an unenlightened person. It's the enlightened person that understands that, right? That's tr some tricky logic there. But it is meant to be tricky logic because what is being addressed? And it's not just being addressed, it's being approached. And it's not just being approached, it's kind of getting up in the face of, right? So what's being addressed here is discrimination, dualism, I'm better than you, my gender is better than your gender, my race is better than your race, any type of discriminative distancing, unequality, inequality, any of that, <clears throat> and wrong. If you perceive any form of better or worse for anything, and Enlightened people know that, right? So that's what's being sort of, but in, again, in this Zen saying, it's very paradoxical. There's no difference between an enlightened person and an unenlightened person. It's the enlightened person that understands that. That's what Ashoka Datta just dropped on Shariputra. There is no difference between the truth of the Buddha and ordinary people's truth. <laughs> the Buddha understands that. Right? Everybody good? Everybody good with that? And these things are heavy. I, I'm not like being like, you got that, right? <laughs> I'm just hoping that we're, 
I, I, I always hope that we just understand what's being discussed in, the, in that regard, right? So obviously this discourse about differences is very at play in this patriarchy, seniority, sanctimony situation, right? So after that exchange, up steps Maha Madguyayana, right? Number two. And if you didn't know, Shariputra and Madguyayana are the Buddha's sort of left and right hand dudes, right? Uh, they were sort of his kind of attendants in that way. But what's interesting um, allegorically, what's interesting allegorically about Shariputra and Madguyayana is that Shariputra was understood to be like the, he understood the Dharma inside and out. He, you didn't want to get into a debate with Shariputra unless you were Ashoka Datta. You didn't want to get into a debate with, with Shariputra because that was his thing. He, he, just, he, he was a master of Abhidharma, a master of all the Dharma. So he was the logician. And Magulyayana, he's the master of the Siddhis, the master of the supernormal powers, right? And so insofar as these are allegorical representations of things, Shariputra is the heady logic guy. And, and, and Maguyana being the superpower guy, well, let's put it this way. Here's a, here's a funny scenario you can think of. Shariputra and Maguyana roll into town to uh, preach the Dharma, right? And so everybody gathers around, and sh if, <laughs> first up is Shariputra. And so Shariputra lays it all down. Life is suffering. Suffering is caused by attachment. Attaching, da, 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 da. If, you, if you stop to stop the attachment, you'll stop the suffering. Da, 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 da. So he lays out the whole dharma on him, right? And if it's crickets, he turns to Magulyana and says, "Magulyana, hit it!" And he levitates, and everybody goes, "Oh!" And they sign up to be Buddhists. I, I'm being funny, but I'm kind of not being funny because it's actually two very old classic forms of persuasion in Buddhism. Persuasion by logic and persuasion by demonstration of supernormal powers. <laughs> and so I, Ashoka Datta just went back and forth with the master debater and kind of put him in his place, ultimately. Basically showed him that his reasoning and his logic was based on difference, differences, right? So then the Venerable Maha Magulyayana asked Ashoka Datta a very interesting question then. What difference do you see between a Buddha and a Shravaka that prevented you from standing up to welcome these great Shravakas, from greeting them? and to yield your seat to them. <laughs> so she kind of threw it back, or Magulyayana kind of threw it back in her face, which was like, no, you're saying you won't get up to greet us, so you're showing, you're differing, differentiating us from the Buddha. You're the differentiator, not us. You're the differentiator, is sort of what Magulyayana is saying, right? Ashoka Datta replies with this beautiful line. Again, it's sort of a, a, a refrain that Shravakas are like stars, which cannot illuminate anything clearly, even though they're everywhere. <laughs> so that's a funny, a funny line, right? So because of the time and because I, I made a nice drawing tonight that I want to get to, Madhulyayana and... Ashoka Datta, they do a little back and forth, and it's a back and forth about the supernormal powers. So that's why I've got my little Michael Yan here. He's like, power? Like, what, what power? What powers you got? Like, I'll show you my power, you show me your power kind of a thing, right? So they go back and forth discoursing about the nature of these powers. I'm going to just spare you all of that. But that, in the same way that the Shariputra back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, kind of culminates in, in her kind of putting this grand pow on the top of it, 
The same thing happens with Magulayana, where they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then she says, then Ashoka Dutta continues saying to Venerable Madhulyayana, the world honored one often says that Maha Madhulyayana stands first in miraculous powers. Maha Madhulyayana, can you, by your miraculous powers, reach the world named Fragrant Elephant, Ganda Hastin? and witness the trees there that all exude a most wonderful fragrance like that of sandalwood? Mahamadguyayana answered, this is the first time I've ever heard that name or the name of that world. How can I go there? Then he asked Ashokadatta, what is the name of the Buddha who teaches the Dharma in that world? Ashoka Datta answered, the Buddha who teaches the Dharma there is named emanating fragrant light to Thagata, the worthy one, the all-knowing one. Madhuyayana asked, how can one see that Buddha? Thereupon Ashoka Datta, remaining motionless on her seat, made this declaration. If a mere novice bodhisattva truly surpasses all Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas, may the Tathagata emitting fragrant light because of my declaration appear here and cause the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas present to see that world named Gandahastin, fragrant elephant and to smell the most wonderful fragrance like that of sandalwood exuding from the trees there. After Ashokadatta had made this declaration, the Tathagata emitting fragrant light gave forth a light from his body. And because of that light, all the Shravakas saw that fragrant elephant world Gandahastin. That, that Buddha was sitting behind a silken net and teaching the Dharma to bodhisattvas and others who surrounded him. His preaching could be heard clearly by those with Ashokadatta. By that Buddha's miraculous powers, they also smelled the fragrance of the trees there, which was like that of the most exquisite sandalwood. The Buddha in that world said, so it is, so it is. Just as Ashoka Datta said, even the initial stage of a bodhisattva is beyond the domain of Shravakas and Pratekyabhutas. When this Dharma was being taught, Bodhisattva Mahasattva Maitreya, the future Buddha sitting on Mount Gr Gridrakuta with the Buddha, asked Shakyamuni, world honored one, why is there such a wonderful fragrance of trees in the air? The Buddha said, Maitreya, Ashoka Datta is discussing the dharmas with the Shravakas and has made a bold declaration. Knowing this, the Buddha of the world called Ganda Hastin, fragrant elephant, by his miraculous powers has caused this fragrance to be perceived and has revealed his land the most wonderful fragrance like that of sandalwood issuing from there is now permeating this 3000 fold world system. Then Ashoka Datta said to Madhulyayana, if a person sees such an inconceivable, superb deed and still has the narrow, inferior aspiration of a Shravaka seeking only to deliver himself, then you should know that his good roots are very few and insignificant indeed. Who would not bring forth supreme bodhicitta after seeing a bodhisattva perform immeasurable meritous deeds such as these? 
Madhuryayana asked, do you know how far from here that Buddha world is? Oh, no. She asked him, Madhuryayana, do you know how far from here that Buddha world is? And Madhuryayana answered, no, I don't. Ashoka Datta said, Madhuryayana, it's absolutely impossible to know and see the Buddha's world with the aid of ordinary miraculous powers, even in hundreds of thousands of eons. The fragrant elephant world Gandahastan is located in a place as many Buddha lands away from here as there are reeds and brushes in all the forests in the world. Then that Buddha withdrew his light, and as a result, fragrant elephant world Gandahastan and its Tathagata both disappeared suddenly. Okay. Sound familiar? Does it sound familiar? Maybe it sounds a little familiar, right? So on that note of familiarity, for the Dharma heads in the house, I wanted to remind everybody that that initial conversation with Shariputra that begins, do you, ride, do you ride the Pratekya Buddha vehicle, the Shravaka vehicle, the Mahaya, what vehicle do you ride? That dialogue is verbatim in the Vimalakirti Sutra chapter seven, the goddess chapter, verbatim. <laughs> so the, the, the references are, they're, they're clear, right? So then if you're like, oh yeah, that was in the Vimalakirti Sutra, then of course this should be completely reminiscent of chapter 10, Sarvaganda Suganda, right? The realm of the perfume trees, the perfume world. So they're playing with very similar motifs here. So if you were here for Vimalakirti, all of the wonderful insights and delightful, joyful dharma of Sarvaganda Suganda and Suganda Kuta, the Buddha there, all of those ideas are at play here, right? And uh, in many ways, like the, when I did the Vimalakirti Sutra, it kind of speaks for itself in a very beautiful poetic way. And, and in fact, I feel like explaining it slips into Shariputra land of like trying to explain stuff, you know? But are there any questions, ideas, comments? Groovy, super groovy. So then, um, sweet. So we have, we have perfect amount of time. Okay, so next up is Kashyapya. Uh, Kashyapya, Maha Kashyapya. And before I get into Maha Kashyapya, uh, again, again, because, um, because of the delicate nature of these discourses, it's very helpful to have a few things in mind. I'm going to very soon <laughs> be referencing the Vajra Chedika Pranyaparamita Sutra otherwise known as the Vajra Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra, this classic Mahayana Sutra. So the more I read uh, Ratnakuta Sutras, the more I read a lot of Mahayana Sutras, they all seem to be referencing the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra. <laughs> it seems that actually that sutra is key in terms of that a lot of the things that the Buddha said in that discourse <laughs> became the foundation for these sutras, if you will. So I wanna point that out. Again, the name of that sutra is the Vajra Chedika Sutra or the Vajra Chedika Pranya Paramita Sutra. It's a wisdom sutra, Pranya Paramita Sutra, dealing with this profound wisdom. 
But in particular, it's the Vajra Chedika, the Vajra Cutter. This is a Vajra Chedika. This is the Vajra Cutter, right? This is a Vajra. It's something traditionally like a thunder lightning bolt, right? A uh, weapon of the god of uh, the sky, Indra. Uh, you can also think of it as Zeus, Zeus's thunderbolt or Chango's thunderbolt or all these gods of the sky that have their thunderbolt weapon. That's the Vajra. So it's a weapon. Traditionally, it's a weapon. And if you were Indra or Zeus or, or somebody, you might, right? Smote, you might do some smoting with your Vajra, your Vajra Chedika. Well, actually with your Vajra, because the Vajra Chedika is this very unique Buddhist twist on the idea of the Vajra. The Vajra Chedika, the Vajra Cutter. If you remember, Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, carries a, a Vajra sword, right? And so tonight, we're, we're on the elephant. We're in Gandahastan, right? We're in Gandahastan, fragrant elephant land. We're mounted on this horse going into battle. And I wanted to speak on this because I'm going to be referencing the Vajra Sutra. I wanted to speak on this idea of the Vajra cutter and Manjushri's sword, right? It's a kind of an interesting Buddhist symbol, right? The sword and this idea of a weapon, a weapon, the Vajra cutter, right? I'm not going to dwell on this for very long. It's just a very, very subtle dharma to prime us for kashapya. And what it is, is, is I want you to think of the nature of a blade. I want you to think in particular of the nature of cutting, which is that there is a way that, that a cut, that a blade, a slice, is inherently divisive it is inherently dividing you can't you can't do it you can't pierce without separating you can't slice without separating you can't it's built into that right so one of the bodhisattvas in the vimalakirti sutra i'm not going to read it even what it comes from the wisdom the, the amazing wisdom of this bodhisattva but the wisdom, he articulates it this way. It's Bodhisattva Simha, Bodhisattva Lion, who says that by means of the of Vajra-like wisdom that pierces to the quick. That's the line. So Bodhisattva Simha entered the Dharma door of non-duality by a Vajra-like wisdom that pierces to the quick. So the mysterious nature of the Vajra Chedika, the mysterious nature of Manjushri's blade is that it does not divide. It is an, a, it is, it, it cuts to the quick. It, it's like, uh, it's like uh, Valentine Michael Smith. <laughs> it's like just gone there. It doesn't divide into two. And the reason why I'm stressing this now, this Vajra wisdom that cuts to the quick, is that we definitely need Vajra wisdom that cuts to the quick, that does not divide. That is the, truly the subtle lesson of tonight, is a, is a Vajra wisdom that does not divide. That. Michael, does not like Vajra, so the diamond diamond um, quality also has something to do with indivisibility. And and also my question is because I'm reading a book about about that um, that the diamond why they chose diamond itself because it's the kind of the hardest material there is, even harder than iron or something like that, and. So isn't like also the material why they chose the diamond as a quality because it's no has it nothing to um do with no yeah that's a very long every people who know me they know it's a very long complicated answer to that um i'm not a big i'm not a big i'm not a big fan of diamond from all the research i've done 
it actually is that the, the idea of a Vajra, which is this weird thunder lightning bolt idea, but the word, the word Vajra is kind of like, whoa. Um, from my research, it, it was, uh, what's a Vajra? Well, it's really hard. And the early English translators did not know particularly like what a Vajra was or something. You know, they just were not doing their research. And so they're like, well, it's kind of like a diamond. I mean, it's hard. It's the hard, hardest thing you could imagine. Mm -hmm. So Vajra sort of, or diamond is a slightly unfortunate, uh, especially, well, it's a little unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So they didn't, like, to, to, for me to understand, so they didn't choose in that time, they didn't choose the word Vajra in, in the context of the material necessarily. Is that correct? So they didn't do that. Uh, it's very, very uh, helpful, important to know that Vajra is this word. Well, it's hard, but it is, it is essentially lightning. <laughs> They are talking about lightning. They're talking to a certain degree, of course, about the thunderous, thunderousness, you know, of thunder. But it's actually about the, 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 the actual lightning. And without getting too into it, because I do want to talk about Kashapya and all of that, I think it's much, even though it's a little... It's, it's not anachronistic, actually. It'll sound anachronistic, but it's actually not. It's more helpful to think of Vajra as electricity. Mm. All of the descriptions of Vajra fit the description of electricity. Interesting. The way the, the liquid, liquid-like pervasiveness of electricity, if you light up a circuit, it doesn't, a circuit board doesn't go, dee, 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 dee. it actually all lights up at once. The nature of electricity is to spread everywhere at once, not sequentially. Those are all wrapped up into the very idea of Vajra as this almost like electric, electric layer of consciousness almost. It's a really, really interesting, profound idea that, again, diamond makes it terrestrial, all too terrestrial. Okay, and one uh, you can just say yes or no, um, because I don't want to talk too much about it. But they often refer the nature, Buddha's nature, um, the nature of the mind to a diamond. No, so they do, and most most normally, and I, obviously, I think I'd have to see what your either text or person you're talking about and all of that. But usually, uh, um, uh, nine times out of ten, ninety nine percent of the time, diamond is synonymous with Vajra. And given what I just told you, whenever in a Buddhist text you see diamond, you should just read electricity. Got it's it. much more helpful. <laughs> then the material hardness. Okay, got it. Yeah, and it, yeah, yeah. And again, they chose diamond because of the idea of impenetrable, impervious, hard, adamantine. So all of that is in there. So I don't ever, I don't want to take those qualities away if you have them in, in mind. I certainly don't want to take them away if you have them in mind, right? But it's like, I just wanted to um, make my claim about Vajra as electricity. Yeah, very beautiful. Thank you. Okay. So real quick on, this is just some fun, fun, superpower stuff. Um, thereupon, the Venerable Mahakashyapya asked Ashoka Datta, <gasps> Did you see Fragrant Elephant World? Did you see Gandahastan? And the Tathagata there emitting fragrant light? Did you, did you see that world and that Tathagata, the worthy one, the all-knowing one? Ashoka Datta answered, Mahakashyapya, can the Tathagata be seen? The Buddha has said, so Ashoka Datta is quoting the Buddha. The Buddha has said, those who see me by form or seek me by sound are treading the wrong path and will never see the Tathagata. 
That is a direct quote from chapter 26 of the Vajra Sutra. So if you read the Vajra Sutra chapter 26, you'll hear and read or see the Buddha say, if you see me by sight or hear me by sound or seek me by sound, seek me by my voice, you walk the wrong path and you'll never see the Tathagata. And what's really interesting about the Vajra Sutra from my scholarly point of view is that when you read it really carefully, it looks like the Buddha is quoting himself from some other text. Like that it's like, like I always say. <laughs> so it's a very important part of the Vajra Sutra that then we get verbatim a quote from Ashoka Dutta, which is, Kashapya says, hey, did you see, did you see that? Did you see that? And she says, if you, if, <laughs> again, those who seek the Buddha or the seek the Tathagata by form or seek by sound are treading the wrong path and can never see the Tathagata. Since the Tathagata's body are, is, no, is none other than the body of the Dharma, and the Dharma and the body of the Dharma is beyond the reach of vision and hearing, how can the Tathagata be known or seen? The Buddha freely manifests any corporal form to suit every sentient being's needs. This is the Buddha's upaya. So, again, because I was hoping we would get to Kishapya, it's why I spent my time on the sign list, right? And this was, this was sort of a bad Buddhist joke, like a, a light joke, right? But the idea is, that I spent that time on the sign list to, so that we know, oh, they're talking about this really wildness, <laughs> signlessness, right? That's like beyond sight, sound, taste, touch, or thought. They're ultimately, this text, Mahayana is saying that, yeah, that's the Buddha. And that's actually, well, let's see what, it, let's see what, I don't want to spoil the surprise. I don't want to spoil it. So, so then, However, so Ashoka Dutta continues, however, Kashyapya, you just asked me, right? You just asked me, did I see that world, Buddha, that world and that Buddha there, the perfectly enlightened one, right? That's what you asked me, right? Well, I see that Buddha, that Tathagata, I see that Buddha not with the physical eye because he is not a form to be seen with the physical eye. Okay, so I'm gonna do. I'm gonna. I'm gonna need to do this a little, a little um, uh, expositionally. Okay, so what's about to be discussed is something known as the five eyes. Uh, kak, uh, uh, ch chakshu. Chakshu. These are the pancha chakshu, the five eyes. And while I'm while I'm scholastically referencing the Vajra Sutra, this is verbatim from chapter 18, where the Buddha says, "Hey, Shibuti, what do you think? Does the Buddha have a physical eye?" Shibuti says, "Yeah." And the Buddha says, "What do you think? Does the Buddha have the divine eye?" Now, traditionally, the divine eye is this kind of Anya, third eye type of idea. In particular, it's the eye, eye that can see realms. So the, the physical eye sees rupa, sees form, shape, color, and number, right? That's the physical rupa eye, physical eye. The divine eye sees realms. So not just this human realm that you think you're trapped in, but heavenly realms, uh, can see ghosts, can see through walls, can see distances. The divine eye is this kind of psychic type of eye, okay? Then uh, the Buddha says, what do you think, Shibuya? Does the Buddha have the wisdom eye, right? The eye of wisdom, the pranyakakshas, right? Or chaksha is the eye that sees emptiness, 
that sees the world in terms of emptiness. That's each individual thing ain't actually an individual thing. So the thing's gone to begin with, Boop. right? So seeing, seeing this mysterious illusory world <laughs> kind of through the veil of emptiness, that's the wisdom eye. Then the Buddha says, hey, Shibuti, what do you think? Does the Buddha have the Dharma eye? The Dharma eye sees codependent arising, sees what I'm tonight just because codependent origination is a little long, interdependence, the interdependence of all things. So that's the Dharma eye. And then finally, Shibuti, does the Buddha have the Buddha eye? The eye that sees here, for simplicity's sake, I just put non-duality. If you took the Vimalakirti course, the entering the Dharma door of non-duality, that's about the Buddha eye. Buddha eye is actually quite technical. It's equivalent to sarvanyana, omniscience, all knowledge. Uh, um, well, uh, Buddha eye is tricky, right? I don't even front either. It's like I can regurgitate what I've read about it in that sense, right? But the idea here is this, and I, I'm, I, apologize if I, I apologize if I'm starting to speed up, but it's just because I do want to get this all in uh, tonight. The five eyes, these five eyes that I just described, it's also a very, very um, old Buddhist idea. Very old. They've been talking about these eyes a long time. And so it's helpful to know that because then if you read chapter 18 of the Vajra Sutra, what's, what's funny actually, what's funny about that chapter is the Buddha says, hey, does the Buddha have all five eyes? And Shibuti's like, yeah, he's got all five eyes. And the Buddha kind of shakes his head like, yeah, you know, well, let me tell you. And he basically, I mean, I won't read it because I'll get sidetracked. But that whole chapter is this really interesting, like a Mahayana twist on the eyes and this idea of seeing. Because ultimately the Buddha is saying that, like, if you think that I, again, if, if what Ashoka Dati just said, if you think the Buddha can be known by his, the, the color, the lapis blueness of his eyes, right? Or by his divine wisdom or by this and that. You missed it. You already missed it. So the Vajra Sutra is already on this. I'm saying all of this <laughs> because what's about to happen with Ashoka Data is some of the most beautiful Dharma weaving I have ever read. And I mean that. Like this verse is so beautiful and its beauty would, would be kind of lost a little bit if I didn't kind of walk you through all of that. These five eyes, interest, it's, all, it's interesting, yeah, the idea that this is only one of the ways in which we're seeing, right? That's interesting. But then the Shokadatta does this really beautiful thing. And again, I'm going to do it expositionally which is that she's about to take the five skandhas, form, sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness, rupa, vedana, samnya, samskara, and vinyana, all five skandhas, she's about to weave together into a Mahayana discourse about the five eyes. <laughs> She says, I see the Buddha not with my physical eye because Buddha is not a form to be seen with the physical eyes. I see that Buddha there not with the divine eye, the deva eye, the deva chakshu, because that Buddha wrought Oh, yeah, yeah. Because that Buddha is free of sense, free of Vedana. If you remember Vedana, sensation, sensation is what happens when sensory organs come into contact with sensory objects. 
Vedana sensation, Ashoka Datta and I have been telling you all night, you cannot see this Buddha, you cannot hear, cannot taste, smell, touch, even think about. So Ashoka Datta says, I, I, I see that Buddha not with the divine eye because there is nothing to be sensed. Even with your precious divine eye, there's nothing to be sensed, right? I see that Buddha not with the wisdom eye because that Buddha is detached from all concepts. So the third skandha, samya, conceptualization or perception, perceiving, this is saying that that, again, that Buddha is beyond conceptualization, cannot be put in any box of any sense, organ, or object. She says, I see that Buddha not with the Dharma eye, because that Buddha rises above impulses or conditioning, samskara. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. The translations are tricky. They are doing impulse, is this idea of conditioning, volitional formation, samskara, right? And so, of course, the way conditioning or samskara works is when I said, hey, look, everybody else, you knew. You knew what that was, right? And you knew because of your conditioning. You've seen one before and you got told what it was. And so when this one matched up to that, you employed your samskaric conditioning and were like, hey, he's got a lighter. It's probably a Bic. Yep, sure enough, right? So that's that. But if, you're, if, you, if you've been here all night for the last hour and 17 minutes, you'll know the idea is that this Buddha is, you've never seen this Buddha before. It is completely beyond your conditioning, completely beyond samskara right? And ultimately, Kashyapya, I see that Buddha not even with the Buddha eye, because that Buddha is beyond consciousness. Vinyana, the fifth skandha, even consciousness. Kashyapya, I see that Buddha by purging the mind of ignorance, desires, and selfish views. Just like you do. <laughs> That's what she says. I see him just like you do. <laughs> Moreover, I see that Buddha by eliminating the view of I and mine, just like you do. Questions? So basically the, the last the Buddha view um, is, is not even the ultimate view, right? Then in that sense. So it's beyond. Wow. <laughs> it, yes, and this is the old, this is the the very it's the very profound message of all of this and it's why at the beginning of tonight's talk Ashoka Datta said I can make the lions roar because I abide in nothing. If I were to make if I were cl to claim to see the Buddha with the Buddha eye, I would be resting on something. And in terms of what she just said, I would be resting on the concept of the I, which of course in English, this gets really funny in terms of the I, right? You don't get, you don't get this play. You don't get this play, right? Uh, and probably in Sanskrit, but you get it in English. And so we're going to play. Everybody good? So the problem here, of course, is that the, this discourse with Kashyapya goes on. Um, I do want to kind of leave a little bit of breathing room, but I do want to just kind of share with you a little bit of how interesting this gets, right? 
So she goes off and saying, no, no, not even the five eyes. Yeah, Connie, not even the Buddha eye, right? So all of that. And then Kashapya asks, right, if no Dharma, if nothing, if nothing ever exists, <laughs> right? I, I, if it doesn't exist, if nothing actually exists, right? <laughs> How can ignorance, cra desires, craving, and the concept of I and mine arise? Since there is no sentient being for it to arise in. And Ashoka Dutta replies, if nothing ever exists, how can anything be seen? I, I mean, I'm going to just pause there. I'm just going to pause. There. This goes on uh, for like another page. But I want to pause there. There... They're having this really, you know, this really kind of intense discourse about emptiness. And if you followed my quick little emptiness discourse in, in which there was no, nothing here because there's not one thing to be here with no color, no shape, no size, and all of that, if you followed that, right, then everything starts to get a little tricky, especially if you start applying that emptiness to, uh, you know, sentient beings, right? But it's sort of like, it's sort of like, oh, whoa. So in that realm of emptiness, Kashapya asks, if, there, if, if nothing exists, if no dharma ever exists, if nothing co ever comes into being, then how is, it that this, how is it that ignorance and desire and the sense of I come into being? Right? Since there's no sentient being that can be seen. And her answer is, if no dharma ever exists, how can anything be seen? This also reminds me of a classic Zen, like Zen master retort. There, there's a classic Zen master retort in terms of like when the student asks, um, what is uh, the Buddha mind or what is bodhicitta or what is Buddha nature? The Zen retort is often, what's asking? That like, that, that, that which is asking, right there. That's it. She's kind of giving that same answer in a way. And, and it's subtle, and I don't have, uh, unfortunately, you know, it takes, a, you know, it, it takes care to do it. But I just want to kind of leave you with that part of it, which is this idea of like, if, if it's, it's so subtle, but he, she's, he, she, he going back and forth. It's this idea of, it's this idea of, of, of in emptiness and no self, no sentient being. What, what's going on here then? What, what's going on here? Right? How, if you're saying I'm not seeing the way I'm seeing and all of that, then what's going on here? And Ashoka Dutta Zen master says, this is going on here in a way. This is enlightenment in a, in a way. She's sort of pointing to how, how do we see anything? How is it that anything is being seen? Therein lies your answer. And it's tricky because she, at least where I'm going to leave you, she leaves you there with like, I, I don't know how anything is seen. And it's like, yeah, just meditate on that then. Just, just meditate on that then. Because it's, it's that, it's that. <laughs> All right, I'm starting to get a little enigmatic. And so I'm gonna um, start winding this down just because I don't think we're gonna come back to Kashapya next week. I wanna share with you 
again, the, the subtle way in which these conversations are resolved in and with that Vajra Chedika type wisdom, right? So at the very end of all of this, Kashapya asks Ashoka Datta, then how should one perceive the I, the ego? So if you're a Dharma head, Dharma practitioner, you're into emptiness, you're understanding all of that. And then it's like, all right, Michael, all right, Ashoka Datta, all right, Buddha, I'm, 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 I'm following you, I'm following you. But what do, what do I do with that sense of ego? What do I do with that sense of I, that sense of self? What's going on there? How should one, um, in, in Michael interpretive parentheses, correctly perceive the I? How should one correctly perceive the I? Ashoka Datta answers, just as the Venerable Kashapya does. Kashapya says, I perceive neither an I nor a mine. And Ashoka Datta says to the Venerable Kashapya, one should perceive all dharmas in this way, for there is no I or mind. I know it's subtle, but the thing about it is you, ha you, you have to appreciate how she answers the question without the ego, without saying, I, I think this, this, and that. So when he, she, uh, uh, Kashapya says, how, how do I correctly perceive the I then? And she says, how do you do it? And, she, and he says, without an I or a mind. And she goes, that's how all dharma should be perceived. And so it's this, again, if, like if you're a philosopher, like, prof, like professional kind of academic philosopher, you have to appreciate the delicate nature of these conversations and the way that they um, gracefully, cogently, you know, w meaning in line with their argument, they back out of it. Totally beautiful. And on that note of uh, backing out of it, I'm going to back out of this sutra. I'm going to call it a night. I'm going to open it up for any lingering questions, comments, answers, epiphanies. As usual, I'm not, I'm going to look in the chat now, but I'm not usually. Yes, the 12 year old is. A badass. <laughs> yeah, that's the epiphany that I'm getting is like this 12 year old's really schooling everybody. No doubt. <laughs> and I think, yes, and I think again, like if you understand, if you, if you appreciate that they're doing this allegorically, there is a heavy message there. Is, is it a bit, I, I don't know, to sort of, on some level, like this last stuff that you're talking about, is like, it just is. Does, well, you know, when, <laughs> I, I don't know, does that make sense for like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, like, it is, like, 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 but not to explain it, it's just, it just is. That's. It is, it is, it is just is, indeed. But I think if I were to try to um, tie this back into the Vimalakirti message, it's, it's deeply about this idea that, that in, enlightenment's not over, up, up there off the screen. It's not down there. It's certainly not in your next life. It's, it's, it's that it's, it, that this is it. Meaning, and I don't mean that this is it, meaning you're enlightened, support, you know, congratulations. Yeah. I mean, that there is, this is the only place to practice. This is the only place to be. All of the wisdom is right here. The, uh, on top of the mountain, the wisdom doesn't get any better in that way. And so all of the things they're talking about are happening right here. And again, 
tying it back to the Vimalakirti in that sense, the idea is, is that Buddhism had gotten a little either, uh, um, well, escapist in terms of this world, but they were spending too much time in the dhyanas and they had developed a very, very ne negative attitude about this world, about our experience of it. And the Vimalakirti is, is, is like, no, no, no. <laughs> this is it <laughs> this is it like there's nowhere else and so it's sort of like that's good news or you know you know depending on which side of the clinging coin you're on but the idea is that it's like great news in that sense what but, i found yeah. sorry go ahead what, connie what i found so fascinating obviously the very last paragraph is that you know she's pointing or he's then pointing to there, so there is no, there's no solid eye. And I found it so fascinating because we believe or the mind believes that only there is an eye, there's mm -hmm. a world. So when she or he, like, you know, they in, in together um, say there is, so there is no eye, but at the same time, there's everything. And it reminds me of like what apparently Sri Naha Raja Maharaji said, something like wisdom tells me I'm nothing and love tells me I'm everything and in be between the two my life flows. And I think that's, that's just so, you know, it ties into that. And I think, I mean, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's the very essence, right? Like what the foundation of Buddhism and um, yeah, it's, thank you so much. I mean, oh, it's, it's thank you, amazing. Connie. Thanks for the quote. That's very beautiful. All right, folks. I th oh, what, what was the quick takeaway for this sutra? If uh, the Vimalakirti was uh, uh, practiced here. Oh, this is about a shokadatta, fearle the fearlessness, the virtue of fearlessness, it is about this 12 year old girl speaking truth to power, speaking truth to authority, patriarchy, sanctimony, seniority. And that because she stands in, in the, in, on the right, she stands in the right because she's a bodhisattva. She's made the vow to save all sentient beings. She can, she can tell them, uh, that's the message that she makes the lions roar, the fearless lions roar because she's a bodhisattva. Thanks, Robert. I appreciate that. That call for a summary. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to call it a night and pass it over to Katie. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Thank you, Michael. This was awesome. Um, and we talked tonight about interdependent origination and if you've been coming for a while you know i say this a lot and it's because it's true um that the collective is interdependently originated with everyone who comes here um you know if there wasn't <laughs> if there weren't students uh mc owens would just be a guy with a whiteboard um and <laughs> if, if it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> and he gets to be a teacher and we get to be students and we get to share the Dharma together because we have this place where we can all meet up and interdependently create this thing from moment to moment. And this is created and sustained by, first of all, and primarily people showing up and being here and sharing in the Dharma. And that is the most important thing. And if you are able to share resources with the Sangha, there are some links in the chat. And I would urge you to only do that if you feel able to freely give. If you're feeling hesitance because you need your resources or you feel that they're better used for a bail fund or something else this week, put them there and keep coming back. Um, keep coming back and co-creating the collective with us. And on that note, um, this Friday, Eric, I think, this Friday we're gonna show a movie um eric is it this friday yes it is all right uh it's called the dalai lama scientist um and so that <laughs> is going to be super interesting right here on zoom pop some popcorn show up hang out and then come right back here next sunday we will be here it's great to see you all thank you michael thank you all for being here
Yeah, yeah, come back for Ashoka Data Part 3. <laughs>